So despite all this evidence that came in, Cooper's put on trial and convicted. Uh, they moved the trial to San Diego Superior Court because the publicity there was so bad. I mean, at, at one of his preliminary hearings, uh, <coughs> there, there was a, a toy ape hung in effigy with racial slurs underneath it. Uh, you know, the N-word and all this and that type of thing. It was a very hostile environment for him. He got death threats like crazy. I've been, I was reading the mail today that he got. It's just every, I mean, about every letter starts N-I-G-G-E-R and goes on from there, you know. We want one more of you, you know, dead, and you know, those kind of thing. Letter after letter. So uh, that's 25 years ago, his, uh, his trial and his conviction, and he's been contended his innocence from the beginning, and for good reason. I mean, three, three or four white people did it. Um, that, that type of thing. So I, I, got, I got interested in it. Um, they almost executed him in 2004, and they're about to try to do it again. Uh, he's lost all of his appeals. He's kind of like the Mumia case came down to a final appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. Kevin Cooper's now reached that same uh, position in his appeal process, where all he has left is an appeal for a writ to the Supreme Court to intervene in his case. He's been there seven times before and never gotten it. When he got his ex execution was uh, postponed in 2004, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, um, they ordered a successive, they gave him another chance at a habeas corpus hearing called a successive or second, second one. They're very rare, almost impossible to get. And they ordered the court to hold evidentiary hearings and to test some of this because Cooper was convicted with some materials like blood and shoe prints and uh, that type of thing that he's always contended was planted. After he was arrested, they took a vial of his blood. And um, he's, he's, always, he's always argued that, that that vial, they used that vial against him. They planted it at the crime scene, one drop. I mean, here's blood, a crime scene full of blood. They plant one drop from this, he thinks, from the vial, and not one hair of his head or from his arm, there's, they can, there's not one hair from a black person in this house. You know, here if we have this furious crime scene. Now you picture a guy coming in with a hatchet in one hand. Here's what, here's what their scenario was. He enters with a hatchet in one hand, a knife in another, and where's the ice pick? Is it in between his teeth? Is it in his belt? But he's using all three of these weapons to kill these people in the most vicious way you can imagine. You would think that would cause some hair to come off. Or if he's going to bleed, to have more than one block, one drop. So they had to, during one of his appeals, they had to send back this vial to another lab to test it. And the lab said, there's something odd about this vial. It's got more than Cooper's DNA in it. There's other people, there's at least one other person's DNA in here, and, and, which indicates to the lab that they'd taken some out and had to make it look like it was full they put somebody else's in. So with that kind of stuff, uh, Cooper was able to get the Ninth to say, this stuff ought to be tested. There ought to be test, further t DNA testing. And what's called, uh, when you take somebody's blood in a vial, they put a preservative in it so it doesn't uh, coagulate. That's the right word, what is it? Um, to, keep it to keep it around, it'll stay around for years, 15, 20 years. It'll preserve it. So. This is the, the, the initials for it, or EDTA. So the Ninth Circuit, the theory would be if they planted this uh, blood, it would have EDT, EDTA levels in it, high, high levels of that. The preservative would show up too. So every attorney general, and uh, this would be Bill Lockyer, and now uh, Jerry Brown, they fought this. They don't want this testing done for the EDTA. They fought it, but uh, the California legislature thwarted them when they passed the deal. They gave death row inmates only the right to DNA testing. And subsequently, that include they could do EDTA testing too. So Cooper got over the objections of the, you know, and why would the government want, not to, want to do it? I mean, don't they want the truth? Don't they want justice? Well, no, they don't. They want him dead. They want this over with. They want to be vindicated. They don't want to be shown that these 
San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies rigged this whole case against him. That wouldn't inspire people's trust. So the, uh, the evidentiary hearings, uh, one of the, as, they were, as they were going on, a woman called up this office I'm sitting in here, Oric, and she's told one of the lawyers here, she said, I see that, I see that uh, oh, I, think, I actually think she called right before the execution date. She said, I wanted you to know, I thought you should know this. The um, night of those murders in Chino, I was in a bar with two of my friends and three very aggressive, obnoxious men came in. Two of them were covered in blood. They had blood all over their coveralls, and one guy had blood all over his shirt and face and arms. And um, she said, I'm pretty, pretty good with blood. I'm, I, I make a living drawing blood. I'm a phlebotomist, and I know blood. And her friend, okay, so this is 20 years later? Yeah. This is 20 years after the 20, 20 years after the deal. She calls up here before the execution, and she can't remember one of her friends, but she remembers the other. And this friend happens to be living in Missouri, so this attorney from Oric gets on a plane, goes out and interviews her, and she remembers it the same way. Some little details are different. I mean, she's got them, these three lugs coming through the front door. The other woman had them coming through the back for the bar is, but that kind of stuff. But she has the same stuff. They're all wearing tennis shoes, and they're covered in blood. And they're obnoxious and very in inebriated or high on drugs, which is what, if you saw those autopsy photos, you know that somebody would have to be very high on drugs, frenzy, crazy, to, be, to do what they did to these people. I mean, it was way past... And they not only killed them, they, it was absurd what they did. There was no need for any of this stuff. So these are, this, was a, this was maniacal, they, these, these killings. And then you think about how counterintuitive it is. Here you are, an escaped guy. You're sleeping in the closet. You're so much not wanting to be detected. You sleep at night in the closet. Would you then go up and murder a bunch of people? For what, for what reason? Well, they say, well, he murdered them to get their car. There were two, there was two cars in the driveway. Both of them had the keys in it, the pickup truck and the station wagon. <coughs> there was money in plain sight, still there on the counters of the house that nobody touched. There were three or four pistols and a rifle in the room where the, this, this, this massacre took place, untouched. I mean, these are all things a guy like Kevin Cooper could use, could sell and make money, make money with. So these women agree to come out to the evidentiary hearing in, uh, in down in, in front of this uh, district court judge, uh, Marilyn Huff. And they recount everything I was just saying to the judge at the evidentiary hearing. And the um, judge discounts them, doesn't, doesn't find them credible. These women hadn't talked in eight years. They had not talked when, when this attorney from here went out he talked to the one on the phone, then he went out and talked to the other. These women hadn't spoken in eight years. They weren't like getting their notes straight. So that's the kind of thing Kevin Cooper's been up against. And then this judge turned down his, his appeal, denied it 100 percent, didn't certify any of his claims. And that throws him to this position now where uh, he's got only the Supreme Court left because the ninth Circuit Court of Appeals wouldn't take up the case again. They affirmed this judge's uh, opinion. A judge uh, for the ninth, though, did write uh, 103 page dissent. I've never seen one like it. I don't think any, you could ask any, any trial attorney you'll ever meet if they've ever seen a judge write a 103 page dissent that takes this whole case together and shows and accuses the San Bernardino people of planning evidence uh, of the judge, the district court judge, being very unfair, thwarting every attempt that Cooper made, honest attempt, good attempt, valid attempt at, tr at his hearings to stop him from getting a fair hearing. I mean, a, a judge saying this, really uh, unusual.